Design exterior one. very much a growth industry, with huge capital investment being made to meet the needs of the 80s and even further ahead. Steel combines lightness with strength. It can be mass produced at an economic cost, and it has become a basic material for the designer. Buildings are no longer put up to last for centuries. Their lifespan is now measured in decades. Economic swift construction, ease of alteration and low maintenance are important factors in design. As the world gets older, distances matter less. The modern car has to go fast, but not too fast. The car of the 80s will have to become a servant, not a master, if it's to survive at all. It'll have to meet rigid air pollution, noise and safety legislation. And steel is the only material which can provide the required impact strength at low cost. Only good design will be acceptable. Let the artist and designer speak for themselves about what they're doing. Because if they use steel, it's for a reason. Start with a sculptor. He handles the material himself, working not to anyone's specifications, but his own. Eric Newton, the art critic, once described me as a, a sort of centaur, half man, half metal, composite of something like that. I rather like that idea. So I've been living with metal for quite a long time now, been surrounded by it, worked it in so many different ways that it's become the raw material of living. The weight and quality of steel has become as much a necessity to me as food and drink, I suppose. Most of my ideas begin, not when I've thought about them or drawn them or anything like that, but when I picked up a piece of steel, turned it over, held it, had a look at it, then I begin to really work. I really begin to think. If you're creating metal, you're not just carrying out a design as a standard metal worker would. You're creating the object as it emerges, as you see it, the making and the thinking have to be one. In a way, one begins with just the odd pieces you might happen to have in your studio. You begin to work in a sort of collage of steel. But there comes a time when certain definite points are reached. And then you begin to develop the thing within its own terms. You begin to create an object which has its own laws, its own weights, its own balance all the structure becomes necessary. interested in prefabricated space structures. 
people would like to cover big spans without using intermediate columns. And not only for big exhibition halls or assembly rooms, they want also to have these unobstructed floor space for industrial buildings. The point is that if you use uh, various forms of space frames, then you are able to obtain huge, big, unobstructed spans. We reached already clear spans which are well over 600 feet, without any internal columns. It's quite possible, using steel, to obtain spans which would be in the region of 1,000, perhaps even more than 1,000 feet. Looking into the future, I think that we will be able to cover much bigger spans. Um, under huge domes, you will have villages and even small towns with completely controlled environment. Um, you also find that these uh, prefabricated space structures will make a major impact on space exploration. I would be very surprised if these floating platforms for the uh, space vehicles would not be built as space structures. Come here, come, come. People often ask me whether I'm in business designing space exploratory equipment. But I'm a sculptor, pure and simple. And this is a piece of my sculpture. My main interest is movement. My sculptures are designed simply to illustrate in three dimensions the ideas about movement which I find exciting. This particular device has a structure based on the leg of a lobster. At the end of it, a head carries four microphones and two radio receivers. The program at present is a very simple one, which makes the structure basically seek out the loudest noise. The difficulty was to design a structure which would be rigid enough to follow the sort of movements which I was asking to perform, and yet light enough not to produce too heavy a burden on the mechanical actuators still, in the end, turn out to be the correct answer. Well, steel came into this because, for the purpose of these vehicles, it is the only material that we know of which would support these enormous loads, which would give us the freedom and flexibility of design, which would give us the rapidity of construction, this was a client who was, in fact, developing a new series, a new range of trucks. And so we were able, right from the start, to look at his problems as the problem of designing a range, a number of trucks, from quite small to very large. And the common area, quite obviously, was the, the cabin, the operating zone. Ergonomics has got two interesting aspects here. One, that the driver should be comfortable, should be safe, should be able to see accurately what he's doing, should be able to play it as delicately as a professional pianist can play grand piano, but from the owner's point of view, that the driver becomes more efficient if the facilities provided for him are such that he's not aware that he's having to concentrate. A cooker manufacturer came to us and their market research had shown that cookers might have additional appeal if the control panels look something like the flight deck of Concorde. Well, this is entirely opposed to our training, which says that everything should be clear, easy to read, functional, ergonomic, and still attractive. And we had great fun, I think, in breaking all the rules that we'd ever learned and turning up with something. Somebody once said about design that the really good solution is the one that looks so 
obvious and so right that there doesn't appear to be another solution. station, quite a lot of scrap metal lying about which I've just heaved into heaps and some people try and pretend it's art but it isn't. I'd rather just hang on to it for a while and grow roses over it. And peas as well, because you can eat peas, can't eat roses. There's a job I did when I was at college was to be reasonably symmetrical, the form had to be reasonably simple. It's got that quality about it that you want to brush the feathers back, or rather like I'm brushing a pussycat head. I tend to steer clear of using eyeglasses or optical aids. I tend to try and touch the width between a line with a movement of my hand. Now I think eyeglasses do inhibit you, especially if you're working on something with form because you've got to keep altering the depth of focus and you're only conscious of one very small area on an object which is a good bit larger. I think techniques play quite a role in the way that these faces have developed on the men. The first one I was a bit tentative with the technique. Then after that I began to settle down again and become more conscious of the character of the face and make them into little individuals rather than technical exercises. combination really with kitchen utensils is metal with either plastic or wood which I thought wasn't necessary so I decided for stainless steel only which I think it makes it much easier to clean as well and much cheaper to produce I did first prototypes in a very thin sheet of stainless which was much much easier to work in and it gives you a much better idea straight away than uh, being misled with something on the paper these are really cooking tongs when you just bend a piece of steel and give it a groove which makes it very rigid you get this fantastic spring and nothing else really is necessary I think that Stainless, it's really most attractive in a flatware with a nice finish. I think as soon as you start using it for hollowware pieces, it loses the quality of a nice solid sheet. Stainless steel hollowware is after all extremely functional, easy metal to use for everyday purposes. For example, a teapot where a handle can be made from steel even cast in steel, which will not get unduly hot. It'll get slightly warm, but not too hot to touch. That's one of the practical advantages. But of course, the other is it requires a minimum of maintenance, and providing it is just washed and wiped up, it's quite reasonable practically all its life.
The cut rays, by and large, started as sketches. There's a combination between the workshop, really, and the drawing board, because cutlery is such a three-dimensional object that it's almost impossible to sort it out on a drawing board. The next stage really has to be the development of many models in the workshop. Because manufacturing techniques are the same in the world over, and stainless steel is so very difficult to manipulate. A certain repertoire of forms uh, more or less become available to everybody and you get almost dull uniformity in design of whatever, hollowware and flatware too, but hollowware in particular. It's almost reaching the point now when one needs to swing back to emphasize something different about stainless steel. of my work is involved in very, very flat, stark areas of metal related to color. I find that when I have a stone that I want to use, I start from scratch, not with the stone worked into my design, but with the design work around the stone. So the stones that I choose for steel are very different from the stones that I choose for any gold or silver. I find that a finished piece of work should be able to stand by itself on a perfectly plain and simple background. Sometimes I like this more than when I see it on somebody else. Well, the reason why I've gone into mass production rather than keeping to one-off pieces is because I would like to bring really good designed pieces to mass markets. I don't see why good design should cost any more than bad design. To mass produce it cheaply, tooling is the biggest expense. What I've done with mine is designed it so that the pieces are identical and a buckle is two identical pieces that interlock together. I went on to produce a chain belt and what I wanted to do was have a link that you could join together and you could take off separate pieces. You could add them to the belt as you got fatter or subtract them as you got thinner. I made this one-off piece which is a body ornament. I did it for fun. Every now and again it's very nice to do a big piece and be frivolous. matter. I think people should be allowed to buy and to design, if you might say, slight excesses like this one. It was perhaps a, a little bit of a, a romantic excessiveness on my part, but it was so simple that everything showed and so everything had to be impeccable. It has never been very easy to make and um, has always been troublesome, but I suppose quite a lot of beautiful things are. Beautiful things don't need to be troublesome if they're designed properly. We started with a little table, a very modest table made of steel. We found steel a um, perfectly sound material for furniture. It has a good history, starting from the time of the Bauhaus in the 20s and 30s. After we did the table, we wanted to do a chair. We thought we'd make it into a rocking chair. It would be a welded structure. It used the rigidity of steel, so that we could string Pirelli webbing, which has great strength, across it to form the platforms of the back and the seat. The Pirelli is trying to pull it together or destroy it, 
and the steel is preventing it from doing this. Where steel is so useful is that when you weld a steel structure together, it becomes one. And as a result of that, you can have very simple, functional, but beautiful forms. There's no feeling of join anywhere. And if the thing has been designed properly, it should have a rhythm about it, which is simply satisfying. I've used steel in sculpture extensively. By using these thin rods, uh, you could virtually start your sculpture by drawing in the air. You could actually surround space with lines of these rods. You then built certain areas up, closing them off, as it were, so that they were solid in space, so that not only were you occupying space, but you were trapping space as form. Steel is a material which has the quality of simplicity, which you can really use in a very simple visual way. has a very simple cotton seal structure. Basically, a slab and a roof slung between six external columns. The attraction for me of having such a structure is basically that the most important parts of the building, which are usually hidden, are here completely exposed. The beauty of it is that the whole thing fits together in a much crisper way and the detailing is much more accurate. Also, you don't have to disguise the joints, which are part of the design. The steel columns, which will um, intentionally mature to a deep brown, will look rather like trunks and blend in with the surrounding trees. The infill, which is all glass, has this great advantage that it reflects the surroundings and one gets all kinds of illusions which give depth to the facade. I think one has from the use of steel gained a feeling of space which one couldn't have using other materials. This is a new exciting feeling which is the sort of thing that people are looking for. The designer and the artist know that only the best will do. So if they use steel, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. 